So hi, Sakat. So can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, this is far better. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, okay, so I think we are already having the time. So I can introduce you and then you can start. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. So for today's seminar, we have uh, Dr. Sekhar Das. Uh, he will speak about something about ultra high energy cosmic rays, we, uh, which are basically particles uh, where the energy can be even higher than the, what generally uh, we find in large hadron colliders. So uh, he did his PhD from Raman Research Institute in early 2021 in January. And after that, he has moved to uh, uh, Kyoto in Yukawa Institute of Critical Physics. And there he is investigating uh, the nature of dark matter in a higher than 100 TeV. So today's talk will be about AGM jets and uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays uh, coming uh, from there. So please, yeah, you can start your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'll share my screen. Yeah, please. Can you see the slides? Uh, no, it is, I think, a document, not the slides. Oh. Can you see? It? I think you have, no, you have. I think you have to share your entire screen or maybe the presentation. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm having some problem. Let me try again. Okay, okay. Yeah, you maybe unshare and share again. まあ、Sorry for some delay. I think there is some issue with this. Yeah, we can actually, yeah, we can see now. Is it okay? Yeah, is it okay? Yeah, you can put in the presentation mode or you can start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, th thank you for the introduction, Jagdish. I'll start. So I'll talk about uh, the work which I did in my PhD on ultra high energy cosmic rays, neutrinos, and uh, gamma rays. So this is the outline of my talk. So first, I'll uh, introduce about the basic concepts on various astrophysical messengers, multi messenger astronomy, cosmic rays, and the energy loss processes and the, also the detection techniques. And then I'll present briefly about uh, two directions of my work. One is on um, studying active galactic nuclei and blazars as the sources of uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays and also uh, neutrinos and gamma rays. And then there is a generic study on the properties of ultra high energy cosmic ray sources and their mass composition but we will uh, i'll try to give the introduction in as detail as possible and of course this first part of the work then if we have time we'll go to this uh, last part so i'll begin the introduction so as we all know that uh, 
so electromagnetic radiation is the most prominent uh, messenger that we use to observe the universe. So photons uh, from very luminous objects are now observable, uh, starting from 10 to the power 5 centimeter radio waves up to very high energy gamma rays having wavelengths of 10 to the power minus 16 centimeters. However, this electromagnetic radiation or photons are not the only messengers of astrophysical processes because at energies beyond TeV, the photons are impenetrable to uh, the universe and it is absorbed by background radiation and also it cannot cross dense matter. So it is difficult to probe the universe with photons beyond uh, TeV energies. So we use cosmic rays, which are protons and nuclei, and it ranges from MeV to ZeV energy. ZeV is 10 to the power 21 electron volt, and they have a very widely varying flux and mass composition. And these particles are, uh, are, are observed using various detection techniques, uh, depending on the energy. For MeV energies, and uh, GeV energies, we have to use satellites, uh, satellite-based telescopes, while for ultra-high energies, the only way uh, beyond 10 to the power 18 or 15 electron volt is to have ground-based detectors because these particles uh, have a very less flux density. So uh, they create showers in the atmosphere and we can detect the uh, hadronic cascade particles on the earth and then reconstruct the shower to find the primary particle. I'll come into those details later. And of course, when there is cosmic rays, their interaction with radiation produces neutrinos and they are weakly interacting and neutral and hence they are the most favorable messengers to observe astrophysical processes. However, there is a flux of neutrinos which we do not know from where they uh, come. And then there is a fourth type of messenger, which is recently discovered, the gravitational waves. But I'll not go into much details about this. My work is mainly based on the first three kinds of messengers. So this is the, uh, this is the spectrum of background radiation. As we know, the cosmic background radiation, the most important is the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. And uh, here we have a black body radiation spectrum of temperature 2.7 Kelvin. Now this radiation spectrum originates uh, from early universe, from the epoch of recombination, and it does not receive any additional injection at the present day. And it, it scales purely adiabatically. That is, we, can, we know the redshift evolution of this uh, radiation. The number density is 410 per centimeter cube and the average energy of these photons is roughly 0.6 uh, MeV. Now then there is another radiation field, the extragalactic background light. This is important for uh, cosmic ray propagation, for extragalactic propagation. So this shows two peaks, one at um, 10 to the power 1 electron volt and another is at 10 to the power minus 2 electron volt which is the reprocessed emission by interstellar dust. Now the extragalactic background light peaks at optical, infrared and ultraviolet radiation. Their redshift evolution is not very well known so there is uncertainties uh, related to modeling this radiation field and several models exist. Now so the Cosmic rays are accelerated inside uh, astrophysical sources, uh, same sources which can produce gamma rays from extremely uh, energetic processes. Now, these cosmic rays are primarily hadrons, as I said, atoms and nuclei, and they can be both galactic or extragalactic, depending on their energies. So this plot here shows the entire cosmic ray spectrum, starting from uh, 10 to the power 13 electron volts up to 10 to the power 20 electron volts. So beyond 10 to the power 17 electron volt, we see that the cosmic ray spectrum starts declining very steeply. And at few times 10 to the power 19 electron volt, this flux decline is very steep and which is the end of the cosmic ray spectrum. 
So this is known as the cutoff. So we'll come to various uh, explanations, possible explanations for this cutoff. And we also see a spectral hardening at few times 10 to the power 18 electron volt. This is known as the ankle of the cosmic ray spectrum. And also there is a knee region in the cosmic ray spectrum, which occurs at few times 10 to the power 15 electron volt. This knee is important because it might be the transition from galactic to extragalactic cosmic rays. So the, the confinement radius of cosmic ray accelerators must be larger than the Larmor radius of the charged particle in a magnetic field. So the galactic magnetic field is not sufficient to accelerate particles to such high energies given the galactic length scales. So uh, we focus on ultra high energy cosmic rays. These are particles of extragalactic origin, as I said, and with energies beyond 10 to the power 18 electron volt. Now they are produced in extremely violent explosions like active galactic nuclei, gamma ray burst or black hole accretion. And as I showed the photon background spectrum, during their interaction, they interact with the cosmological photon backgrounds, the CMB microwave and the extragalactic background light consisting of optical UV and IR radiation. And they can also be deflected by the intervening cosmic magnetic fields. Now, re regarding their acceleration, it is not very well known, but of course, uh, the Fermi second order Fermi acceleration mechanism is an uh, accepted uh, process whereby these particles gain energy through repeated reflection between magnetic mirrors. And then there is unipolar induction. So, high, uh, highly spinning uh, magnetized objects like uh, newborn pulsars or neutron stars. Now, they can induce electric fields. And in these electric fields, the, uh, the, the particles can be accelerated to very high energies, taking the rotational energy from these objects. This process is known as unipolar induction. And the most important thing is the interaction of this um, ultra high energy cosmic rays with background radiation produces uh, diffuse gamma rays and neutrinos and which, which are of cosmogenic origin. And they provide important uh, constraints about uh, the ultra high energy cosmic ray sources. So here I, uh, I briefly summarize the main energy loss processes of the ultra high energy cosmic rays. The most important one is the photopion production. So protons uh, can interact with background radiation producing neutral or charged pions through delta resonance. The charged pion decays to produce uh, uh, electron neutrino and two muon neutrinos while the neutral pion decays to produce gamma rays. Now, the threshold for this photo, uh, for this resonant photopion production or delta resonance is roughly 10 to the power 19 of the order of 10 to the power 19 electron volt. So the flux suppression, which I showed earlier at these energies, this may occur because of interaction of protons with the CMB. So, any protons or cosmic rays having energy higher than this must be attenuated while propagating. And this attenuation will produce neutrinos and gamma rays. And the resulting signature in the cosmic ray spectrum will be a flux suppression. Now, there is pair production. It has the highest cross-section among photohadronic processes. Hereby, a nuclei can interact with a background photon to produce electron and positron pair. Then there is nuclear beta decay that also produces electron neutrinos. And then there is photo disintegration. This is applicable only for heavier nuclei where the nuclei is irradiated by 8 to 30 MeV photons and they produce an excited nucleus. So this excited nucleus can de-excite and give gamma rays. So the, how are these ultra high energy cosmic rays detected. So when, when an ultra high energy cosmic ray uh, hits the top of the Earth's atmosphere, it interacts with the nuclei in the atmosphere, primarily nitrogen uh, molecules or nitrogen atoms. And this creates a hadronic cascade and a chain of interaction uh, follows. So 
the primary particle loses energy so fast it creates a shower like appearance this is known as the extensive air shower and this interaction continues until the uh, energy of the primary particle is below a certain threshold and the energy losses are only ionization losses so uh, to give you a rough estimate uh, a one ultra high energy cosmic ray particle of energy 10 eev can produce up to 10 to the power 10 secondary particles spread over an area of 20 square kilometers now the depth in the atmosphere at which the number of particles reaches its maximum is known as the shower depth maximum now this is an important quantity because the value of x max tells us the energy and the uh, mass number of the primary particle which hit the top of the atmosphere so x max is usually higher for light nuclei so for protons the maximum number of particles or this longitudinal shower profile shows uh, x max at a deeper depth in the atmosphere than say for example iron nuclei so the PRA OJ observatory is the largest observatory on earth that detects uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays it is spread over an area of uh, 3600 square kilometers so there are 1600 these small dots on the image on the left they are the water cherenkov tanks so there are 1600 water cherenkov tanks in a triangular grid separated by 1500 meters that is 1.5 kilometer is the spacing between two water cherenkov tanks and then there is a smaller area of 24 square kilometers where there are 60 water cherenkov tanks with spacing of um uh 750 meters so and then there are four stations of uh fluorescence telescopes these blue lines with four there are total 27 fluorescence telescopes in these four stations and this fluorescence telescopes uh, measure the uh, development of longitudinal uh, air shower in the atmosphere so this water cherenkov detector when uh, ultra high energy uh, cosmic ray particle creates hadronic cascade the resultant particles can enter the water cherenkov detector and induce a cherenkov radiation now this cherenkov radiation is uh, reflected on the walls and detected by the photomultiplier tubes uh, three photomultiplier tubes and the signal is reconstructed based on the electromagnetic component and the muonic uh, component and there are also scintillation detectors inside this uh, water uh, Cherenkov tanks. They contain 12 metric tons of ultra pure water. And these fluorescence detectors are more efficient for detection of the primary energy because this can directly measure the uh, energy content in the whole shower. So, as a primary particle is coming more and more deeper in the atmosphere the hadronic cascade spreads and it interacts with the nitrogen molecule so the nitrogen molecule can de-excite uh, in the ultraviolet radiation and this creates a fluorescence now this fluorescence light is mapped by the fluorescence telescopes in the four stations and we can have the image of the development of longitudinal shower profile the colors uh, shown here indicate the uh, the time of uh, development uh, okay so for modeling uhcr sources uh, in our studies uh, or in general uh, it is common to consider a representative group of elements such as hydrogen helium nitrogen silicon and iron so the spectrum shows many features and the composition can be modeled depending on those features and they are and we can uh, place very strict uh, upper limits on the abundance fraction of each elements uh, for injection spectrum uh, si since we can see that uh, this spectrum is a, a, a power loss spectrum 
this cosmic ray spectrum at least beyond a uh, few PeV. So we can very well assume that this is a non-thermal uh, process which produces the ultra high energy cosmic rays and hence we can consider a power law in energy for the injection from their sources. Their sources are still unknown and there are uncertainties in photo disintegration cross-section of intermediate mass nuclei such as carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. And then there are uncertainties on the extragalactic background light models because direct measurement is complicated because of large background radiation. And there are different methods which are used uh, to model the extragalactic background light. One of the most important uh, model being the empirical methods. That is, when we have a very high energy gamma ray source, the absorption of the gamma ray can lead to attenuation in the spectrum at very high energies. Now, depending on the attenuation, we can calculate the opacity of gamma rays in the universe. And this gives an idea of the EBL uh, background. Now, we also consider discrete and continuous energy loss processes. The discrete processes being that I mentioned, uh, this photohadronic processes, photo disintegration, and the continuous energy loss process being the that due to adiabatic expansion of the universe, which affects all particles uh, in an equal manner. And then there is also uncertainty due to the galactic and extragalactic magnetic fields. Uh, th there, there are some uh, well-established models for the galactic magnetic field such as the Johnson and Farrar model or the Shirkov model, but the extragalactic magnetic field is uh, very uncertain. And we also don't know the magnetic field in, uh, in cosmic voids and such regions, but the deflections in them must be taken into account for anisotropy studies. So be before going to modeling of ultra high energy cosmic rays or their propagation, I also want to tell about another messenger, the neutrinos. Now, these neutrinos are extremely difficult to detect because they have low mass and no electric charge. So it is difficult to make the neutrinos interact. Uh, so a kilometer long detectors are required and they uh, collect neutrinos from the cosmos. Now, neutrinos can be uh, detected by different methods. So one, one is the muon neutrinos when they interact outside the detector with uh, say nucleus, most preferably water molecule, which is used uh, in actual detectors, it produces uh, muons and that muon can travel for kilometers of distance without decaying. This creates a muon track, which is detected. And this is known as uh, charge current interactions. And Ice cube is one such important neutrino observatory. I'll show the details for ice cube next. And there is other kind of detectors also, such as large volume of waters are contained in tanks. And when the neutrino interacts with electrons or nuclei, they deposit uh, the energy there. And that deposition can be used to calculate the energy of the primary neutrino and also the type of neutrino. So they, they can also create secondary particles like electrons or muons, which produces Cherenkov radiations. And then there is scintillation detector, which is not extremely popular, but is still an efficient method to detect neutrinos at lower energies. So the ice cube neutrino observatory uses a cubic kilometer of ice in the South Pole, and it, it 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 has uh, uh, it employs so this is the structure of ice cube it instruments approximately a cubic uh, kilometer of antarctic ice sheet at a depth between 1450 meters up to 2450 meters now between 1.4 kilometer and 2.4 kilometer there are 5160 digital optical modules now these digital optical modules are like small uh, photon detectors which can detect the cherenkov uh, photons emitted by uh, charged particles when they travel at a speed higher than the speed of light in a certain medium so what happens is when a high energy particle 
hits the ice cube ice, it interacts with the water molecule and it produces a muon. And that muon traverses this, uh, these strings, the, which the, these strings have a vertical separation of 17 meter and uh, sorry, the digital optical modules in a string are placed 17 meters apart and the distance between two strings is uh, maybe one, 125 meters apart. And using this 5000 digital optical modules, one can track the muon uh, travel uh, direction and distance. And this can be used to reconstruct the primary neutrino energy and the direction. And that direction can be used uh, to point in the sky and look in other messengers such as gamma rays or uh, maybe other wavelength photons to find the sources of these uh, cosmic neutrinos. Well, but the, although Ice Cube has detected several high energy neutrino events, it, the sources are still not identified except one correlation that we had in 2017. So the, the arrival direction of these neutrinos are fairly isotropic and we can from the niche, isotropic nature of these uh, neutrinos, it is generally implied that the origin of these high energy neutrino events are extragalactic. Uh, in 2017, uh, 22nd September, one neutrino emission from the direction of a blazar was spatially and also temporarily correlated um, with the ice cube neutrino event. Now, Temporal, temporally correlated means uh, the this t, this object TXS 0506 plus 056 is a Fermilat detected gamma ray blazar. And when the neutrino uh, arrived at South Pole ice, Ice Cube uh, distributed uh, automated alert uh, to several observatories and detectors for follow up multi wavelength campaign. And it found that a flaring gamma ray blazar was coincident. Uh, with this ice cube event. So this is the only spatial and temporal correlation that has been found so far. Although there are many ice cube events which have been spatially correlated with blazars, but uh, such a high significance association has not been done again. So this, this uh, influences us to consider blazars and active galactic nuclei as the sources of uh, neutrinos and whenever there is neutrinos, neutrinos cannot be produced by leptonic processes. The production of neutrino has to be always associate, associated with hadronic processes. So sources of neutrinos must also be sources of cosmic rays. So this uh, led us to study the hadronic origin of uh, the spectral energy distribution, the SED of the blazar there can be signatures of hadronic radiation. So a blazar is an active galactic nuclei. And when the collimated jet of outflow, the relativistic jet is pointed along our line of sight, we call it a blazar. Now they can transport energy and momentum to very large distances. And uh, the radiation is also do highly Doppler boosted along our line of sight. Now this, uh, emission region inside the blazar jet, it, it contains a plasma of uh, electrons and protons in a magnetic field. And this uh, spectrum shows a peculiar feature of two peaks, as I show on the right. Now, the low energy peak is almost always due to synchrotron radiation of relativistic electrons in the magnetic field of the emission region. And the high energy peak, there are several propositions. One explanation is it can arise uh, from uh, inverse Compton scattering of the synchrotron photons, that is a synchrotron self-Compton method, or it can also arise from uh, external Compton. By external Compton, I mean Compton upscattering of photons that arises from this broadline region or accretion disk. They can enter the jet and in the co-moving jet frame these photons are highly doppler boosted and these photons can be upscattered by electrons which produces a high energy 
peak. Now, beyond TV energies, as I also mentioned earlier, they are absorbed by the extragalactic background light during their propagation. So, roughly beyond Mm, in, in, at sub TV energies, we sh we see uh, attenuation in the blazard emission spectra. Although there is no uh, such physical process which restricts uh, the blazard spectra from going to much higher energies. Uh, of course, Compton scattering is not possible to produce. Uh, is not uh, is not a suitable method to produce photons at much higher energies because of. Klein Nishina effect, there is a suppression of inverse Compton radiation at such energies, but hadronic processes can, of course, produce photons at much higher energies. So, we study a leptohadronic model where the electromagnetic cascade initiated by secondary electrons and positrons coming from the interaction of ultra high energy cosmic rays can contribute at TV energies. And this electromagnetic cascade initiated by ultra high energy cosmic rays, uh, they can extend down to GV energy. So, what happens is that when a ultra high energy cosmic ray is propagating through the universe, it interacts with CMB and EBL and produces secondary high energy electrons and photons. Now, these electrons can again uh, upscatter the background photons or lose energy in the extragalactic magnetic field. And the high energy photons can also undergo gamma gamma pair production with background photons, again producing electrons. And this chain of interaction continues producing a lot of secondary particles. And this electromagnetic cascade can lead to the production of a gamma ray signal along our line of sight. Now, the ultra high energy cosmic ray horizon, the distance up to which we can observe ultra high energy cosmic rays is limited of course by interaction with cmb and ebl and it is roughly one gigaparsec for um, cosmic rays with energy 10 to the power 19 electron volt and it is nearly 100 megaparsec for uh, energies higher than uh, five times 10 to the power 19 electron volt it decreases rapidly because of the process which i showed earlier the delta resonance whereby proton and a photon interacts to produce uh, pions and of course uh, this this cosmic rays are deflected in galactic and extragalactic magnetic fields so when we model the blazar emission spectra using secondary radiation from ultra high energy cosmic rays we must also consider the survival fraction of this cosmic rays along our line of sight so for this we consider a uh, uh, an angular region which is equal to the angular resolution of modern day gamma ray detectors and of course for any modeling the total luminosity in cosmic rays electrons and magnetic field must be less than the eddington luminosity of the central black hole in the agm so so we so the right hand side is a schematic diagram of a blazar at the center and this cone is the extrapolation of the blazar jet uh, up to the point of the observer the, the observer is situated on the surface of this sphere and we also indicate the emission direction now when cosmic rays are accelerated in the blazar jet they can come out of the jet and they can disperse in the magnetic field in various directions but for the observer to observe a line of sight gamma ray component originating Plus. from yeah this is indrin speaking uh, i have a question you said that the protons are being accelerated yes so uh, what kind of acceleration process i mean you think the protons can be because these are all i, I believe these are all non thermal protons right you're talking about yes 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 so beyond ev what, energies what can what kind of uh, you know acceleration pr uh, process will you think are they, viable in these conditions in a blazar jet say suppose yeah so there there is uh, well an, in another work uh, one there is one shot acceleration mechanism which is a diffusive shock acceleration where this uh, protons can be re reflected repeatedly between magnetic mirrors in the plasma 
and they can gain energy which is also the concept of uh, fermi acceleration mm-hmm. so maybe fermi acceleration mechanism is the dominant process for acceleration of cosmic rays okay but the, also the electrons will be uh, accelerated as well right yes the electrons are also accelerated and mm-hmm. i show the spectra where the elect the relativistic electrons and the protons they radiate simultaneously but but electrons which are accelerated they obviously will not come out of the jet because the energy loss time scale of electrons is much much faster compared to hadrons so the cooling will be much rapid than protons like mm-hmm. cosmic rays are actually hadrons are not cooled sufficiently in a magnetic field or radiation field mm-hmm. as as fast as electrons do sure sure yeah okay okay thank you for your question so uh yes so uh, so we we find the survival of cosmic rays uh, along a certain uh, uh along a certain direction of their initial propagation direction and so we been the survival of cosmic rays in 0.1 degrees from their initial propagation direction in various values of extra galactic magnetic field now uh, we consider a random turbulent magnetic field uh, given by a kolmogorov power spectrum and th- this magnetic field uh, can be defined by certain parameters one is called the Uh, turbulent correlation length it can be thought of as the distance in a magnetic field in which up to which a charged particle can travel without getting deflected much and then there is the root mean square field strength so here i show the root mean square field strength for uh, various cases and we see that for uh, magnetic fields with uh, magnitude higher than 10 to the power minus 4 nanogauss or so the survival rate within 0.1 degree is extremely low so we we take this is a bit arbitrary and not well constrained we but in the literature there are upper limit and lower limit ranging between 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 7 nanogauss for the root mean square field strength of extra galactic magnetic field and we take a value of 10 to the power minus 5 nanogauss and we then calculate the rate of interaction for protons and check that whether the acceleration energy can actually reach ultra high energy so we can tweak some of the things the parameters and we find that so this blue line is the rate of acceleration and along the x axis i show the proton energy in the co moving jet frame and along the y axis is the rate of various processes the black line is the escape rate for escape we consider a diffusive escape of course for electrons we don't need to consider diffusion because electrons as i mentioned lose energy very fast so usually the energy loss for electrons is considered on d- uh, dynamical time scale that is radius divided by the velocity of light but for protons they are not cooled sufficiently and they can diffuse in the medium for a long time so we considered a diffusive escape given like this and we considered the diffusion coefficient d as a power law in energy now when this two uh, power is one half we call it a kraichner model of diffusion we just consider this model of diffusion and this is shown by the black line in the plot this is the escape rate the red line is the uh, photopion production rate and this green line is the bethe heitler pair production rate for cosmic ray protons and we can see that this interaction rates are much lower than the escape rate and also uh, acceleration dominates over escape at least up to 10 to the power 19 electron volt inside the source now this is of course a representative case for a single blazar we have we have considered an ensemble of blazars and done the similar analysis for many of them i'm just showing the plot for one of them and 
in the jet frame we see that the maximum energy the protons can reach is uh, 10 to the power 19 electron volt so now we propagate this cosmic rays that come out from the blazar jet and they produces a secondary cascade radiation uh, sorry uh, in the last slide you said like you have taken the uh, so can you hear me yes yes i can hear you uh, so in the last slide you mentioned that okay when you took the diffusion it is a kind of diffusion uh, which is like uh, Uh, Jagdish, your voice is breaking. Yes. Yes. But then, uh, so is it okay now? Okay, yes. maybe I can. Yeah. So, uh, so in the last. No, Jagdish, it's very difficult to understand. We discuss about the event facts. Okay, so maybe I can ask in the uh, last. Okay, you please. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. Okay, I'll I'll move on. So in this uh, uh, in this slide, I so show the multi wavelength uh, spectral energy distribution for the blazars, and so you can see there are two plots. On the left is the purely leptonic emission, considering there is no cosmic rays accelerated in the blazar jet and it produces the typical synchrotron and synchrotron self-Compton uh, emission. Mm, oh, uh, there is no external Compton here because we consider uh, BL lesser T objects. BL lesser T objects are a specific type of blazars where there is, uh, there is not uh, much uh, background radiation, I mean optical uh, spectrum. So there is no external Compton happening because the emission region is outside of the broadline region. Uh, so as you can see that here the fit is not good and we try to increase the energy, uh, uh, the maximum electron energy to much higher value to fit the high energy data. But as you can see, this is already at TV energy range. So increasing this uh, energy, maximum electron energy beyond TV does not help because of klein nishina effect. There is a suppression in the efficiency of inverse Compton scattering. So when we add a cosmogenic component, it is shown by the green line on the right-hand side plot, if you can see. So the, the observed spectrum is greatly improved. And um, actually, I have a more uh, detailed uh, plot I can show. Uh, yeah, Shoikot, could you just tell us what is this cosmogeny uh, sources you're talking about? The cosmogenic gamma rays are the gamma rays which are produced from the interaction of ultra high energy cosmic rays during their uh, journey from the source to Earth. So, ultra high energy cosmic rays uh, can interact with background radiations like. CMB and extragalactic background light, CMB and EBL. And this interaction produces uh, high energy. Uh, okay, please wait, I'll show. So this interactions produces this neutral pions and charged pions. And this decay of neutral pions can give high energy electrons and neutral pions decay to give high energy gamma rays. Now these gamma rays can undergo gamma gamma pair production with the background radiation fields like CMB and optical photons or ultraviolet photons. And these electrons can lose energy in the extragalactic magnetic fields. And they can also Compton upscatter the CMB photons to high energy gamma rays. So various processes continues and this is known as electromagnetic cascade. And this electromagnetic cascade gives finally a resultant gamma ray spectrum at okay. earth. That so cosmogenic. yes, that we call cosmogenic. So if it is produced in the cosmos, we can call it cosmogenic. If it is produced inside the source, we can call it astrophysical because it is produced in astrophysical object. Okay. okay. 
uh, yes so the fit improves considerably when we add a cosmogenic component and uh, we also use the survival rate within 0.1 degree as i already showed earlier we choose 0.1 degree because for gamma ray detectors like uh, fermi large area telescope fermi lat the resolution is roughly uh, 0.5 degrees at uh, more than at more than 100 gv energies the resolution to a single photon of energy more than 100 gv is roughly 0.5 degrees and we also consider uh, the power conversion of ultra high energy cosmic rays to secondary photons and taking into account all this we empirically calculate the luminosity in cosmic rays in this manner because we need to check that the luminosity in cosmic rays does not violate the eddington luminosity of the central black hole of this blazar and uh, like so is this the model that you fitted is it actually really fitted or you just adjusted by eye uh, the components that you used here no no there are multiple values for each energy coming from different detectors so you mean chi square estimation or statistical analysis that is Bayesian analysis you did something like chi square or bayesians or it's just a manual fitting it's it's a manual fitting because the number of degrees of freedom are uh, I, I mean they, they are very less so for chi square fitting we need a number of degrees of freedom right yeah that's the, why you asked the question because uh, yes the uncertainties in uh, observation of uh, multi-wavelength acd the number of parameters that we have is much much higher than the number of data points that we have mm -hmm. so we cannot do statistical analysis although there are studies okay. by other you groups that you used for this model is just uh, i mean kind of uh, from literature or just from knowledge previous knowledge right the initial yeah. values that you used to fit or because there are multiple parameters that you need to fit uh, uh, need to adjust to get this plot. yes 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 and also when we add this additional cosmic ray component the number of parameters increases even more yes Okay, so how actually I was wondering just how uh, you adjust uh, all the parameters to I, find it. Uh, uh, I can show one plot of this uh, fit uh, if you can see. Mm -hmm. So this is how the fit looks like uh, when we zoom in. Okay, here the data is also very fast, right? Uh, greater than uh, 10 to the 11 kV. Uh, 10 to the power 11 yes electron volt so sub tv maybe yeah. tv one yeah. one tv these data are kind of uh, very much parsed right yes 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 mm. okay mm. okay uh, okay and th so we we can now corresponding to this gamma ray production of course, the interaction of cosmic rays will also produce neutrinos. Now, these neutrinos also we calculated using the same technique, the uh, survival rate along the line of sight and also the using the same cosmic ray luminosity which is required to explain the gamma rays. But we see that the survival rate, uh, uh, not the survival rate, the flux is much lower than the sensitivity of currently operating an upcoming neutrino telescopes which will detect neutrinos at uh, 10 to the power 17 18 electron volts so this black dashed line is the uh, differential flux sensitivity of ice cube detector to cosmogenic neutrinos and these two detectors poema are grand are still not in operation they are proposed detectors so these are like simulated sensitivities of this detector so in, in summary of this work, I'll say that gamma rays produced in hadronic channels are actually, they can actually successfully explain the very high energy spectrum from high frequency peaked BLLAC objects. So this is one caveat, like if we have a blazer for which the high energy peak is at much lower energies, then of course the radiation from electron uh, is sufficient to explain this uh, high energy peak. 
only in the cases where we have very high energy radiation observed at 10 to the power 12 electron volt because if we are observing a radiation uh, spectrum at 10 to the power 12 electron volt that is surprising because if these photons are coming from inside the sources they must be absorbed in the extragalactic background light the attenuation due to ebl so we invoke a different process to explain this unattenuated spectrum in high synchrotron peaked blazars and for this the distance of the blazars must be such that a significant fraction of uh, secondary particles can reach earth like not all the particles are scattered off by magnetic field and the the detection of ultra high energy cosmic rays and neutrinos simultaneously from blazars will be very crucial to know if this is a valid model or not so if we consider a distribution of uh, blazars instead of a single blazar now we have a luminosity dependent density evolution function we can derive a luminosity dependent density evolution function for blazars now what is this function this gives that for a given luminosity and a given redshift what should be the number of blazars so it is the number of blazars per unit luminosity per unit cosmological volume so using that function we can simulate the distribution of blazars in a luminosity redshift space and we simulated this distribution not uh, keeping in mind that what fermilat can detect or cannot detect this is the total distribution and then we draw this green line uh, to differentiate uh, to uh, to to separate out this zone into two parts one for the resolved blazars and one for the unresolved blazars so fermilat has detected roughly 742 FSRQs and FSRQs are flat spectrum radio quasars which shows uh, strong uh, optical uh, line emissions and BLX are mostly continuum emissions. So Fermilat has detected nearly 2072 resolved BLX and 742 resolved FSRQs. Uh, our simulation gives that there are at least 427 FSRQs which are unresolved, which is below the detection threshold of Fermilat. And there are at least 5,900, which is roughly 6,000 BLX which are unresolved. So now what we try to do is we consider all these blazars together and try to calculate what can be the diffuse emission from these blazars due to ultra high energy cosmic ray. Now this diffuse emission, since these are unresolved, this diffuse emission should not exceed the gamma ray background that formula detector has measured. So I'll not, uh, so, so here the, we, we consider the integrated flux between 100 MeV to 100 GeV, which the formula has measured uh, and calculate that flux to use the, to find the luminosity uh, and employ the K correction, that is a redshift correction. And then this luminosity is used to find the luminosity of protons. Like we can, we can relate the proton luminosity to this observed gamma ray luminosity by a factor called eta, which we define as the baryon loading factor. Like the, the hadron luminosity or the baryon luminosity is a certain factor times the gamma ray luminosity. And again, the uh, the neutrino luminosity is of course a fraction of the proton luminosity or the cosmic ray luminosity. So finally we have a neutrino luminosity, the observed neutrino luminosity as a fraction of the observed gamma ray luminosity. Now this is the result we have. So on the left plot the black uh, data points uh, between 10 to the power 8 and 10 to the power 12 electron volt is the Fermilat measured diffuse isotropic gamma ray background and this green line is the diffuse gamma ray radiation that can occur from all these uh, blazars resolved and unresolved taken together. So the different lines the dotted dashed and uh, solid lines corresponds to different maximum acceleration energy of cosmic rays. 
in the blazars suppose they are accelerated up to 1 ev or 10 ev or 100 ev so we see at 100 ev the flux is saturated uh, by the igrb constants at tev energy and this shaded region and this data points at 10 to the power 13 to 10 to the power 16 electron volt is the ice cube observed diffuse astrophysical neutrino flux so we also calculate the diffuse neutrinos and we see that the diffuse neutrino flux from this process can be a maximum of 10 percent of ice cube detected astrophysical flux at uh, 6 pv in the pv energy range so in this work we mainly study what can be the maximum contribution of cosmogenic neutrinos to the ice cube observed neutrino flux in the uh, TV, PV energy range. And we can also constrain the maximum possible value of the baryon loading factor for different maximum proton energy. And so this is this plot uh, shows the diffusion of uh, cosmic rays depending on energy as i said that depending on maximum energy 1 ev 10 ev 100 ev we have different results for gamma rays and neutrinos but what about cosmic rays when we see a cosmic ray coming from a direction can we also relate the cosmic ray to a source it is very difficult because for roughly 10 ev the cosmic ray propagations are almost rectilinear inside the galactic magnetic field which has a rms field strength of uh, micro gauss but for energies less than 10 ev the directional information is completely lost so we do a simulation uh, to find the trajectory of cosmic rays inside the galactic magnetic field and we see that below 10 EV, it is very difficult to correlate a cosmic ray event with the astrophysical source. So in summary, I'll just show that diffuse neutrino flux from blazars in the energy range 10 to the power 15 to 18 electron volt uh, can actually rise from UHCR interactions and it can be a maximum of 10 percent of the ice cube astrophysical neutrino flux and we assume that cosmic rays efficiently escape the system beyond 10 pev now this is also a uncertainty there is no observational constraints on the fact that protons has to escape the blazars beyond this energy but of course if cosmic rays are accelerated to such high energies it is more probable that they will escape because the escape rate is usually higher than the photohadronic interaction rate in the photon fields inside a blazar and in this scenario we have considered that more luminous sources contribute more to neutrino and gamma ray backgrounds that is the proton luminosity is proportional to gamma ray luminosity although this may not be always true because uh, there has been analysis which shows that majority of the gamma ray background can originate from gamma ray blazars but the same gamma ray blazars can account for a maximum of 15 percent of the astrophysical neutrino flux and we also constrain the baryon loading factor so i think uh, there is not much time so maybe i'll stop here if that is okay uh yeah So, can you hear again? Sorry? Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, now. Uh, hello. Yes. Swedu, yes your connection is terrible. I think this corner room has some problem. The charge, if your internet is good. No, no, no. Subindu should take charge. I mean, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you... no, that I didn't hear, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Subindu. Yeah, so... Subindu, please take charge. I don't know. Can you, can you just manage it? I don't know. The internet is very poor. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank. Uh, let, let us thank uh, Shoikot for a uh, very nice talk. Uh, questions?
if you have questions you can directly ask or raise your hand either way yes uh, i have one question so regarding this diffusive shock acceleration yes, yes. yeah so uh, like uh, what are the typical estimates of the magnetic fields in those blizzards where uh, this process is taking uh, roughly of the order of 1 gauss uh, 1 gauss yes okay okay and uh, like uh, what are the like uh, typical lens scale like the how far uh, away that is from the like the central indian sub sub parsec sub parsec scale jets okay so like for sub parsec scales like 1 gauss is enough for the yes maybe say few times 10 to the power 16 cm mm -hmm. okay so okay. um okay go ahead raj please ask yeah, yeah that's it so this related one uh, just a clarification mm -hmm. so uh, would one gauss magnetic field be able to confine uh, you know uh, variance Uh, so this is the emission region where we have one gauss no, no, so that you understand what i'm trying to say is that around one gauss mm -hmm. be able to hold back all those you know accelerated uh, uh, protons or baryons for that matter um yes actually just do a order of magnitude calculation you just write uh, you know gamma squared rho h yes squared. yes Yes. and that if we compare with b squared by 8 pi would i mean would they match yes the if yes of the order then uh, there is no way magnetic field can sort of hold them back yes actually the the value of b squared by 8 pi is maybe one order of magnitude less than the uh, proton luminosity okay yeah in in ideal case there should be equipartition between right, right. all the components but um, Yes, so the 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 assumption is as long as we don't violate the Eddington limit, okay. so maybe this is not a unique uh, unique solution, but viable solution. Okay. But let me let me say again that the emission region and the acceleration region are separate. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Okay. Understand. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, any more questions? Come on, students. Yeah. So this cosmic ray spectrum you have shown. So in that, uh, what can you? Oh, uh, uh, which one? Uh, general cosmic ray spectrum. So the ah, okay, you have okay, okay. yeah you have mentioned the above uh, knee point. So that cosmic rays can be extra galactic. So hmm. I just have a doubt. So below uh, that knee point. Hmm. can it be extra galactic or strictly galactic below knee point below knee point it's usually strictly uh, galactic because uh, when the extra galactic cosmic rays they start losing energy and by some process if they are coming from very far distance say few gigaparsecs and their energy falls below pv then it's very unlikely that they will reach earth they will be deflected i mean such low energy cosmic rays have less uh, magnetic rigidity less uh, capacity to maintain their direction so they, they would be just deflected in some other direction and not arrive at earth so yes there can be some background cosmic ray of course and which is an important uh, uh, important component that collaboration like ams o2 uh, has to deal with when they measure the galactic cosmic ray uh, spectrum yes but usually below pv energies the dominant contribution is from uh, the galactic sources okay thank you yes there is a chat let me look at the chat box okay so paravan so somewhere you mentioned about there's a question okay so would you okay. read it or i should i read it for others uh, i can't open chat can you okay, please fine. read so i let me read it Okay. Somewhere you mentioned about magnetic mirror or so. So considering not a perfect continuous deflection, can this phenomena cause any periodic variations or so? Okay. Uh, first of all, this is uh, this is very difficult question for me. 
because I did not study the acceleration part, but yes, a periodic variation in the energy is also possible because usually when we have the uh, reflection between magnetic mirrors, uh, there is a threshold up to which the particle can be accelerated. And when the baryon reaches that energy value, it is no longer confined between the mirrors. It escapes. So, uh, I mean, a periodic variation in the energy that some cosmic rays are accelerated to some energy and then some are, I mean, uh, a cosmic ray spectra with periodic variation in energy is maybe not possible. It's usually a power law. So Fermi acceleration process uh, produces a power law spectrum. I'm sorry if I am unable to provide more details. Okay. So Paravan, I think you'd, you'd be satisfied or you can write to him if you want to. Yes, of course. Uh, Anyone else? Okay, so if not, let us thank the speaker. I must say, Shoikot, it was a very nice talk. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, looking forward for more, you know, papers from you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let us thank. I'm closing this. Oh, I can't close, can I? Okay, maybe we all can leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be better. Okay. So Jagdish, you close the meeting. <laughs> bye. Yeah, bye.